All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. You guys are tuned in here to another episode of the Wolf Crypto Podcast. I am your host, the Wolf Crypto. Got ourselves another guest, special guest here. Mr. David Doss has decided to take the time to come sit down and join our show, talk a little crypto, and talk about some other things, maybe about his business as well, since he has a tech startup. Pretty, I would say, lucrative background here. And I'm going to let him speak on it a little bit. David, go ahead, introduce yourself. Tell us what you're all about, man. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show, James. Glad to be here. So yeah, real quick on on my background, I focused most of my career on marketing, strategy, operation, mainly in the tech and innovation space. So that's ranged from startups, Silicon Valley and, and such, to digital transformation initiative for larger organizations like Citibank, Saks Fifth Avenue. And specifically, I've been in the digital asset and crypto space for about the last seven going on eight years. And I've worked with crypto and blockchain initiatives at Citibank with Gemini, the exchange, as well as a variety of other players, all creatures great and small in, in the blockchain and crypto space. And what True. I do now is digital asset fund management and blockchain program management. Awesome. Awesome. And I did see that you are the uh, founder of CK, which is a fun U.S.-based asset management consulting firm. I wanted to talk a little bit about that, especially when it comes to that particular space. I actually, myself, tried to do a little asset managing on the crypto side, but then I was like, eh, maybe this is not my realm. If you wanted to tell us about that venture and how that kind of came about, we'd love to hear about that as well. Yeah, for sure. So... But the firstly, just in general, something that I became really passionate about was really creating pathways where I and you know, family could and friends could really be able to get more access to, to better opportunities around the let's say, investment space, ability to grow and maintain wealth. In, in more kind of strategic ways. And this is something where I grew up amid the backdrop of the Silicon Valley tech boom and bust in, mm-hmm. in the Silicon Valley area, then the housing boom and bust that, that kind of followed that in separate but related cycles. And I also spent a lot of time working, traveling, studying around the world, just a variety of different, different countries and regions. I, after college, I. I lived and worked in Indonesia where the, the rupee at the time was, gosh, I want to say about 7,000 rupee to a dollar. And now gone up even since then, just a rapid inflation or have seen also with, with my wife and her family from Nigeria and spending time out there, the value of the Naira has really decreased dramatically in the dollar, but also in terms of absolute returns, it's just, there's been double digit inflation most years for for about as long as a lot of people can remember places mm-hmm. like that all around the world. But just thinking through whether it be whether it be on a more emerging market level of having a challenge with a currency or on a, maybe a more mature market level of just not really having access to a lot of really high opportunity areas where, you know, a lot of people just tend to dump money into the stock market and the bond market, same old stuff that has not necessarily been working for them. Mm-hmm. No matter what, basically became really passionate about providing things that can work better for people in their specific situations and managing a, basically helping to help guiding the growth of a friends and family group of capital over the last six plus years was seeing ability through, through active management, diversification, these kinds of easy to say, but hard to do things that take work day in and day out. Seeing those types of approaches be able to to really grow total absolute wealth, but also to outperform something like just growing everything into Bitcoin. That's really where it all started. And then from there, basically, the next step was building out some structures that can compliantly accept capital from different people globally that can fulfill the types of expectations people have from investment into more kind of mature asset classes, things like insurance, administrators, auditors, institutional grade custody, all of these sorts of things. There's getting good returns is really only one part of the equation. 
and then right. making sure that the risk is mitigated, that there's systems and operations in place, that all of those things are buttoned up and clear is another story altogether. So it really ended up being a, a journey of developing both of those. Well said, well said. Now, you did mention you do have some experience working with City, and you did mention that you worked with Gemini as well, considering that obviously City is more of that traditional, and then Gemini is obviously crypto-based, trying to get it to mainstream. How do you see the role of blockchain crypto evolving with traditional finance, and what impact do you think might this have on wealth management? Yeah. Well, there are a bunch of different, bunch of different ways we could just, we could talk just the entire time just about that, I think. But a couple of things that, that, that kind of come to mind right off the bat would be one is, one is digital assets themselves or specifically what are, what people often refer to as cryptocurrencies, but I would encourage people to consider from, from a kind of wealth management standpoint as digital assets, just thinking of them as the role that they can play in the traditional financial ecosystem. So what I mean by that is, is a couple of things. One is how allocating into that asset class can drive value from the more traditional wealth management, modern portfolio theory, business school, Wall Street type of, of mindset. And that is really as a hedge against volatility in other asset classes. So there are a couple of related things to be thinking about there. That one of them is that most people put most of their money into stocks, bonds, real estate. And by the way, I'm not an investment advisor, it's not tax, legal investment advice, but just talking through what a lot of people do, talk with a hundred people, probably going to see at least 70, 80, 90 that meet that type of profile. But that being mm -hmm. said, what a lot of analysis is being modern portfolio theory analysis, research from Forbes, ARK Invest, surveys of high net worth individuals, family offices, people even with kind of more traditional framework and habits are, are indicating a preference to allocate somewhere between two and 10% of their overall assets into the crypto or digital asset space. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is the kind of the smoothening effect that can have on the broader portfolio is that when the most of the assets that you have that might be in say real estate or, or stocks, when those are zigging, crypto <laughs> might be zagging the thing. And we saw that in certain housing crises, we saw that also during COVID, that there was more resilience in, in the digital asset space in a lot of ways compared with some others. Saw that also during kind of this, during kind of collapses of the bond market that, that Bitcoin and other digital assets ended up significantly outperforming. The examples go on, but all things be equal, it can really provide that smoothing effect. And when you think through that as something like, say, a $100 million portfolio, just for easy math, someone putting in something like $5 million into digital assets, you know, yes, it's volatile. And if there's downward volatility and there's a 30, 40% drawdown, functionally, you still have a $100 million portfolio if you put that $5 million into the digital asset space within a margin of error. But then right. the other thing to be considering is the asymmetric upside. When that's properly, properly managed, there is incredible upside potential of being able to double, triple, quadruple that, that specific investment. And so, for example, if that $5 million initial investment becomes a, uh, a $20 million, um, then that's something where the, that overall hundred million dollar portfolio is up, you know, very significantly. So that's another way to be thinking about it. The other thing though, is that I think, I think digital assets, crypto can learn a lot from traditional finance that a lot of people came into crypto with a bit of a gambling mentality. And if that's, if this is just for, for fun and it's with money that you don't care about and can afford to lose, then maybe, that, maybe it makes sense to, to gamble. Maybe it doesn't, but all things be equal, you know, a lot of people came in with a gambling mentality, but expecting it to somehow magically turn into a good investment decision and just saying, oh, I'm going to do hundred X leverage trading on crypto futures and mm -hmm. it's all going to be great. And then some people lost everything. Other people lost more than everything where these stories of people taking out a, a credit card debt to then hundred X leverage it. And then they owe mm -hmm. they, their hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in debt. In addition to having lost their entire crypto principle, those sorts of things I think have given the digital asset and just base a bad reputation. But at the end of the day, taking on, taking on tried and true investment approaches is something mm -hmm. that 
that, that you can do asset evaluation, disciplined analysis frameworks, these sorts of things, proper risk mitigation, regulatory frameworks. These are all things that when they're applied, they can apply to, to any asset just because real estate has different terminologies than the stock market doesn't mean that they're, that they're entirely different beasts. They're maybe they're apples and they're oranges, but they're still both fruit. So I guess those are a couple of relevant areas, but there, I, I could also go on. And listening and hopefully they are paying attention and picking some things up. Cause I can speak to what you had mentioned as far as that whole mentality of coming into the crypto space with the gambling sense. And me, I originally got in around like 2017, didn't really know too mm. much about it, just did a lot of research. And I started small. I did small increments, 100 bucks here, stuff that I could afford to lose. Now, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of stories of people losing their life savings, mortgage payments, their house equity, you name it, I've probably seen it in the space and you probably could attest to that. And I think that's something that traditionally, you probably could speak to this, I think that mindset is already there because stocks in the markets, it is what it is. You got to go in there with some type of knowledge, knowing that, okay, I'm going to start here and then I'm going to work my way and figure out, okay, where do I need to do? I need to do some DCA. Do I need to do this? But with crypto, I think people have that whole, oh, I've seen this guy make it overnight. And I feel yeah. like that's not really realistic. And those stories only happen every so often. And I feel like people really get attached to that. And they really shouldn't because I feel like once they get in, they come in with that mentality, they get burned and then they never come back to the space. And it's wow, you're actually, For sure. you might be missing out on some opportunities just because of that bad experience. And correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm, are you able to give financial advice? I normally always tell people I can't give uh, I'm not a financial advisor. Yeah. Okay, so people that are watching this, listening, this is not financial advice, still do your due diligence, but we are, he is educated here, folks. And my next question to you, since you, like I said, you've been in the game, you've worked with some clients, when it comes to crypto asset management, where, I'm trying to think where I want to take this here, how do new people that might have worked with traditional wealth management, asset management companies, find those crypto firms that are doing this. Cause I feel like there's not a lot, but you're starting to some kind of just poke their head into the space. So people that are looking for these type of companies, what would be some advice or what would you say to those guys that are out there right now, listening and watching? Yeah, there's a couple of different. There's a couple of different things to be, to consider partially an answer to this question and partially an answer to your previous question, a couple of kind of general categories in terms of allocating capital into the, the crypto and digital asset space is that I think thinking through just the it being special, like any other asset class is I think important here where we're, what we look to do, for example, is provide that middle ground Goldilocks solution, so to speak, between just investing in Bitcoin on the one hand, and then mm -hmm. on the other hand, going all in on a lot of these kind of early stage opportunities, ICOs, IEOs, et cetera. The, to, to that point, if you talked with most people about their stock market preference, they would say most people would, or just let's say equities preference in general, most people would, on the one hand, they would not just put all of their, all of their stock allocation into the number one stock by my market cap, which is in a lot of ways, what just putting everything into Bitcoin might be like. And then on the other hand, the, they would also probably not put all of their equities allocation into private, not public equities offering like Facebook 20 years ago, because for every Facebook right. 20 years ago, there's, or was it even around 20 years ago, but plus or minus for every, every Facebook 15 years ago, let's say even there's, there are probably at least 70, 80, 90 that didn't quite turn out as predicted or else just went completely to zero. With that in mind, then what a lot of people would do in the, in say the, the stock space is that they would diversify across high cap, mid cap, low cap. They would diversify across use case, fundamental value in, in stocks that could be healthcare, industrials, tech, financial, 
services in the digital asset space. That could be actual currencies that were designed as such versus other digital assets, such as smart contract platform or use cases or decentralized file storage, store of value, et cetera. And then the other thing that to be considering is basically true diversification, just dartboard approach of just picking, picking a bunch of things also on average doesn't tend to do very well either in, in any space, but specifically the looking for truly minimal correlation, not just with, within crypto, but also with other markets. So on the, within crypto side, a lot of stuff just follows Bitcoin, right? So right. looking at things right. that actually have, that are carving their own path in terms of use case, but also in terms of price behavior and that can balance each other out is really important and and also thinking through things like neither overfitting nor underfitting where having let's say just buying a little bit of all twenty five thousand plus different cryptocurrencies out there probably is not going to be worth it from a cost and risk mitigation standpoint and switching right. blockchains and all this stuff but then on the other hand having just one or two positions might also not really quite do it and then from a kind of larger market perspective thinking through what true diver diversification means as well is important. I think through, for example, that Bitcoin actually shows often really tight correlation with the NASDAQ 3X leveraged index fund, where mm -hmm. basically you might have, in many situations, not all, you might have, you probably could be about as well off just trading the NASDAQ 3X as trading Bitcoin. So just thinking through those considerations. Beyond that, to the sense of what people to be working with, I would say, think through what the use case is. Are you more what, you know, people call a retail investor, where it's maybe you're putting in more, you know, a hundred, couple thousand dollars, or are you putting in more, are you an accredited investor, for example, where you're getting mm -hmm. access to more of these kind of private offerings, things like this is one, one question to be considering. The other is, are these going to be passive strategies or active strategies where increasingly we're seeing passive strategies be super accessible, things like the Bitcoin ETF, the Ethereum ETF, mm -hmm. we're probably also going to start to be more, you know, go down the list of the top asset ETFs or potentially top 10 basket ETF, things like this. But those are ultimately passive where think through, does that meet your goals? Sometimes they can, they can have different fee structures from active strategies, but also they can in many cases have less perform be less performant than active strategies. So overall things through that kind of those spectrums of number of things you're allocating into things through whether this is the right fit for you in terms of public versus private mm -hmm. active versus passive also things through jurisdictions. Is this something that's going to meet your needs in those regards? I think there are a lot of reputable places, so including let's say you know, various around the world, but there are also a lot of, of not so reputable places in my experience and kind of opinion for a lot of the, the folks that I work with, there's a lot of interest in the Cayman islands. There's interest in, in the, the middle East, including the United Arab Emirates, but there's mm. interest in Switzerland, but then there are, there are some really out there places, um, that could be worth thinking twice about relatedly also think through what are the risk frameworks of a platform that you're working with, whether it's active or passive, something like, something like a, the Celsius's and block of this world were ultimately like way over leveraged. And in my view, yeah. really, so that was me waxing poetic about all these different factors. But if I had to put it as, as simply as possible, I would say that this last cycle around got a lot of people got really burned by platforms mm -hmm. that were uh, over leveraged on very risky positions, such as, such as futures or basically obligations to purchase things at specific prices, which in a very, very volatile market, especially when it's leveraged can be catastrophic. And then they didn't really, they were not transparent and they did not have proper regulatory oversight where basically people didn't really know that those things were going on to the extent that they were conversely looking for credible places where there are, there are audits, there are regulators looking for places where there are, there is risk mitigation procedures in place and include restrictions on leverage policies on who, where, what, you know, why and how options or mm -hmm. future are used. These sorts of things I think are really important.
Yeah, because you just mentioned it. Celsius, BlockFi, you get the FTX in there, Voyager. Yeah. It Rio's was capital. a pretty, yep. yeah. yeah. And I actually used a couple of these apps and fortunately actually refer some of my friends. I'm thinking, oh, I've yeah. used it, had some experience, didn't yeah. see it happening like that. And then a couple months later, you turn around, you're like, oh, wow, all these exchanges are getting shut down. And I felt like that's putting another bad taste in people's mouth because if you're around during those yep. wild ICO days when everybody was throwing money in the ICO and then they again again or where they can say be. So I'm hoping as we move along, hopefully these companies that are taking notice, hopefully they can make some adjustments going forward. That way we don't see as much of that happening because again, yep. I feel like people that got burned by that again, it's always tough to re-enter to something where you're still maybe not over that loss, especially if you really lost a ton of money. And my next question, which I feel like you already talked about a little bit, which is diversifying. And I feel like everybody has their opinions about this. I actually talked to, was I think I had last guest on here who was like, you know what? I'm not the biggest fan of diversifying. I like to just put a lot into one position and that one position goes up. It is what it is. But like you were saying a little bit earlier, especially when it comes to the traditional side and the crypto side, diversifying is that still same way where you're looking for different sectors of the space. Because crypto has a bunch of different sectors. You got the DeFi space, you got the gaming space, you got AI is coming up. Yeah. So would you say that same approach as far as diversifying your portfolio is like the ways that you would do in traditional finance when you're looking up, all right, let me find these particular projects that I want to go ahead and invest in. Let me let that sit. And for people that might be new, what would your advice be as far as like number? Obviously, it might depend on how much money they bring in, into the market. But if you were to say you want to diversify this number, what would you say in your case and in your experience? So yeah, that's a good question. So there, working backward, you made a couple of points there. In terms of ideal number, it can depend, but broadly speaking, I would say somewhere between 30 and 60 positions at any given point could be mm. really where the value is at. Maybe it could be more between 20 and 60, depending on where the market is. Mm -hmm. For example, during more of a bull market, it's going to go, a lot of markets will go more bottom heavy, so where it's the the smaller market cap stocks or the altcoins will be the ones that are really clinging. Mm -hmm. But then in the, in a bull market, that is, but then in, in more of a, a bear market, you might be, you might be talking about maybe more really the top being the most stable or the most performing and see that also in, in other asset classes, it could be probably fewer and higher chipped assets during a bear market is what a lot of people indicate a preference for. And then more and lower cap assets during a bull market is also what a lot of people indicate a preference for. That being said, I think it's also not just about then if there's not magic numbers, it's also about the quality, not just the quantities. You could pick in theory, 60 different assets and they could all be just perfectly trailing coin and you could have functionally no real diversification, right? Or you could be conducting research before you make those decisions and on an ongoing basis because things change in life in general, not just in crypto. And I would say if you are going to be doing something like that, consider whether you have time to be monitoring that or whether you can work with someone, be it people or a platform or whatnot, can you do have the time and, and effort to do that. Where I think a lot of these things are, are very simple not very, but at least somewhat simple in, in, mm -hmm. in theory, but in practice, it's one of those things where when you're busy with your, you know, full-time job and, and then your significant other calls and there's a family emergency and this, that, and the other thing, it's, it's very easy to keep it top of mind when it's fun and new and exciting. But then when things are difficult in that market or else when things are just difficult for you personally, very easy to let it aside or make, you know, the wrong decisions. So think through either how, what systems you have in place to prevent that from happening or else what people or services or processes you can work with. Yeah. So I think those are a couple of the kind of key considerations in my view. Okay. 
And that's some good, good advice here, folks. Cause for me, I actually started with five, six. He's saying, Hey, start off with 30, 60. If you obviously are in that position, you have money to play mm-hmm. with. Everybody's mm-hmm. situation is different. So guys, keep that in mind. Something I want to really ask you about, cause obviously regulations is something that's a constant mm-hmm. ongoing subject here. We're going to constantly hear about it. What impact do you think current and future crypto regulations will have on the investment landscape? Yeah, firstly, just in general, for better or worse, the U.S. is a jurisdiction that a lot of people look to in general, right? So whether the regulatory framework is something that ends up encouraging crypto in the U.S. or discouraging crypto in the U.S., a lot of folks will react either with or against that, where some jurisdictions will say, okay, we're going to copy what the U.S. is doing. Other people will Mm -hmm. say, oh, we see where X, Y, and Z areas of that framework are not maybe in certain people's best interest. And that's how we can really, you know, carve out a niche as a, as a regulator that's really proactively providing more options to people those sorts of things. The other part would be, I think there's also a lot of interesting things coming through the pipeline from a regulatory perspective in Europe and particularly in the EU and the UK, just from my personal opinion standpoint. And relatedly that we also see where there's interrelations between different frameworks where, for example, the British for better or worse colonized some giant part of the world, like around a third of the world, right? A lot of countries speak. British legalese, right? And so then there's also a lot of reciprocity between them around what's going on between something like the U or let's say England specifically versus the Cayman Islands versus other spots. It's not always a one-to-one by any means, but there's a certain level of kind of understanding each other's dialect and being comfortable with it. It can often happen. And yeah, I think beyond that, there's generally, we're just, we're seeing core areas where there's a lot of going to be a lot more traction from a regulatory standpoint and one is the basically more the emerging markets where there's honestly just more incentive to develop frameworks around emerging technologies you see this with something like say the development of the cell phone ecosystem where the u.s had one of the best landline systems in the world and then they didn't really they weren't in a huge hurry to develop a cellular network and then there were other countries that ended up with more mobile adoption or better quality networks or both faster when they didn't have landlines because it was of more value to them to invest in that technology. So I I see that happening where emerging markets will start leading the charge on some of this, this regulation. And then the other is some of these smaller nation states around the world, ranging from the Middle East to Europe, to the Caribbean, to uh, East and Southeast Asia, where there's just things can happen faster, essentially and enact more regulatory progress at a much more significant speed than, than some of these kind of large countries. So those are some of the, the things that, that I think through in terms of where we can provide the most value and also what are the opportunities as well as the, the risks to be considering. Right on. Now, guys, we are starting to run out a little bit of time here. I am going to ask Mr. David Doss here a uh, kind of a... Uh, Final question here that you can go ahead and answer for our viewers. <laughs> but I'm trying to figure out what would be the best last question to ask him because I feel Dream like wisely. he's been giving us a lot. <laughs> I feel like he's been giving us a lot of insight, a lot of in good information. So people that might be uh, listening, hope you guys are taking some notes and watching. But I think which would be a good final wrap up question for our audience here. What would you? tell investors that are hesitant to incorporate digital assets into their portfolio? What would you, I don't want to say like advice because I don't want to make it sound like it's financial advice because again, folks, this is not financial advice. So yeah, what would you tell those people? I guess give them some insight that they're a little nervous. They already had their traditional portfolio. Now it's like, all right, I want to incorporate digital assets, but... Ooh, there's some hesitation there. What would you tell them or advise them in a sense? What I'll say, I hate that word, but yes. I would encourage people to, to firstly do their own research and just think through what is your specific situation. For some people, 
0% allocation makes the best sense for others, 10% for others, 20%, um, for others more, it can really depend on someone's goals, priorities, financial situation, all of that. But beyond that, I would encourage people to think through what it's not just about what asset class you've invested into, but how you've invested into it. Investing into the digital asset space could be anything ranging from those early stage ICOs and pre-sales where let's say 90% of them or more could go to zero and the other 10%, whether they're moonshot plays or, or, or whether they, whether they grow somewhat or whether they grow dramatically, either way, it could be 10, 15 years before you really see a significant return on that money. Whereas something like, let's say investing into mining, some people tend to prefer because there's slow and steady returns to some extent somewhat more similar to investing into a cash flow positive type of company. Whereas other people prefer more kind of that, you know, let's say, uh, you know, passive ETF type of vehicle where they just don't want to think about it at all. But then that means that their upside may be limited and also their, their risk mitigation may also be limited as well but they could end up spending less time and effort or fewer fees on it. Or the other thing would be these actively managed strategies where, you know, you have someone in your court at, at various points and really focused on what's going to best make sense for the, the changing market conditions. So that different of these are the right fit for different people at different times. But I also would encourage people to think through what is, what are the risks of not investing into the digital asset space for, and that's, you know, there are some of those that are general and some of those that are very specific to, to, you know, a person's situation. Those can range from having just parking everything in, you know, in cash, be that dollars or any other currency, all things be equal. Inflation is a, a factor, whether it's 3% or 5% or or 30% or 500%, it's something to be considering, right? Or are there also risks that you have in your current strategy that digital assets could help to protect against in terms of, say, maybe overexposure to things like stocks or real estate that could really hurt you under certain, certain circumstances. So the, these are, I think, a couple of different things to be considering. And then beyond that, as a alternative asset or alternative investment in an emerging space. I think for many people, it's a question of making sure to research and vet platforms, people, processes that are being involved, double, triple check these things. And also to, in most cases, only invest a very or relatively small percent of an overall portfolio into something like this, where Maybe it's something that's enough for someone personally, where when it, when it goes up under proper supervision and, and within proper frameworks, if it goes up significant enough to make a change in their overall lifestyle or kind of situation, but also where it's low enough that day to day, week to week, or if there are kinds of bad things that you hear about in the news that happen to that, then that it's something that's, that's not going to, you know, dramatically change your life for the worse, but is something that could dramatically change your life for the better. Boom. Mike has been dropped, folks. Mike has been dropped. Like I said, folks, Mr. David Doss has to get out of here. But if you guys want to go ahead and follow him along, like I said, he is the founder of the CKC Fund. I will be dropping all of his good links, all of his information. So that way, if you guys want to reach out yourself, maybe you guys might have some questions. Maybe you might want to have to manage your assets. Who knows? But all that will be in the description down below. And hopefully, maybe if you guys really did enjoy my guest, David, here on the show, maybe David might come back. Because again, we've been chatting up here. He's been teaching me some things. Hopefully, he's taught you guys some things as well. Want to hopefully get an opportunity to really pick his brain. Because again, we could probably talk about crypto defy probably for even much longer. Other than that, folks, going to get on out here again. I appreciate you guys tuning in listening watching to the wolf crypto podcast show before i really wrap up the show mr david doss is there anything that you would like to say as far as your last words to the audience out there yeah firstly just big thank you james to 
for hosting me uh, on the show. Appreciate the insightful questions. And thank you to everyone who's been listening. To James' point about staying in touch, we'd be glad to to have a conversation. You can reach out to me via email, david at ckc.fund. Also very active personally on LinkedIn, publish a lot of content ranging from articles, news, information, videos, all these things. TKC is also very active on LinkedIn. Uh, we, we have a newsletter with monthly uh, market commentary as well as you know, various other uh, insights for, for those who are interested. So yeah, I would encourage you to, to be in touch either directly or to, you know, follow some of our comments or content rather on, you know, LinkedIn or, or wherever else may make sense for you. All right. So that's it, folks. Once again, I'm your host, The Wolf of Crypto. I appreciate y'all tuning in to The Wolf of Crypto podcast show. And until the next time, again, not financial advice, guys. Always do your homework, do your due diligence. And until the next time, y'all take it easy. Peace.